So we just took a look at the StockAd fault model. And this is a fault model used to uh, model faults at the logic level. Again, this is just one way to represent a defect at a certain level of abstraction. We'll now look at a different um, fault model. This one is used at the circuit level, which means we are looking at transistors, and it's called the stuck open, stuck short fault model. So in this model, each transistor can have one of three states. Either it's working properly, or working normally, or it's stuck open or stuck short. When a transistor is stuck open, it is always going to be cut off. When a transistor is stuck short it's always going to be on short here doesn't mean that it is necessarily going to have zero impedance it's just going to have a very low impedance of a four of an on transistor again this fault model can represent uh, multiple defects if the transistor is um, stuck open this doesn't actually mean that there's an open circuit in the finished chip it could mean that some defect has caused the threshold voltage of the transistor to rise uh, to such an extent that the transistor never turns on, for example. Or there could be an open circuit, or there could be a misalignment that failed to create a proper transistor. We really don't know. A, a stuck-short transistor is going to be um, always on with a uh, small um, on impedance. Again, it doesn't mean that there is a short circuit created using metal lines over the, over the transistor, although that's a possibility. It could also mean that the transistor gate is always connected to a supply somehow or to high voltage that turns it on. It could mean, could mean that the threshold voltage of the transistor was pushed too low by some kind of accidental implant, for example, so that the transistor is always on for the range of inputs that we use. It could mean a lot of things. So again, this is just a model. It's used to uh, model uh, the facts, but it, it, it should not reflect any information about the specific defect that has happened. Uh, so again, the number of possible faulty states that each transistor can find itself in is two, because it could all either be stuck open or stuck short. So if we look at a circuit and we see n transistors, then that means that there are n times k possible faults in that circuit meaning that uh, if we have a four transistor circuit, we could have eight possible faults with each of the transistors being either or stuck short or stuck open. Uh, now we are go also going to assume, like the stuck at fault model, we're also going to assume that we have a single fault model, so that only a single fault occurs at a time. Only a single transistor can be faulty. Uh, this is an assumption, but it is based again on the foundation that uh, multiple faults, when they occur, occur at a much lower probability than single faults. Now, let's look at how the stuck open, stuck short fault model functions. So this is a two input NAND gate. It's probably the simplest circuit that we can consider, but the same concepts we apply here are going to apply to any larger CMOS circuit. Like the stuck at fault model, what we're going to do is we're going to um, fill in the truth table of the gate or the circuit that we have, and we're going to observe rows in the truth table at the expanded truth table, which uh, contain errors that expose underlying faults. Uh, but because we are dealing with a fault model at the circuit level, we need to write down a, an electrical uh, truth table, which contains electrical information about uh, uh, output voltages rather than just a logic truth table. So the normal truth table of the two input NAND gate includes the first two columns of this truth table. When the input is 0, 0 uh, the CMOS gate produces an output of VDD. Same uh, for 0, 1 and 1, 0. When the input is 1, 1, uh, the output is going to be 0 volt. Now, we're going to um, also fill in the truth table with columns for each of the four transistors either being stuck open or stuck short. And we need to uh, look specifically at how to expose these faults because um, it's, not, it's not as obvious as with the stuck at fault model. So let's look at the uh, fault M2 stuck open. We'll come back to M1 stuck short but because it, it, it requires um, a slightly more complicated um, 
handling than the N2 stuck open fault. Uh, but for N2 stuck open, just means this just means that M2 is always going to be cut off. We can guess that rows in the truth table, which will uncover this fault, have to be rows where M2 is supposed to be on. Because if M2 is supposed to be cut off anyway, then it being stuck open is not going to produce an error in the truth table. And so the inputs uh, 0, 0, and 0, 1, and 1, 0 are, uh, sorry, the inputs 0, 0, and 1, 0 are inputs in which the transistor M2 is cut off anyway. So these two inputs will always produce outputs that match the correct output of the gate. But also the input 0, 1 is going to produce the correct output. Because even though M2 is supposed to be on for this input and it is cut off, transistor M1 is cut off for this input anyway. It's going to cut off the uh, way to ground for the output and therefore the output is going to be VDD and will produce the correct CMOS output. So the only input combination that actually exposes this fault, this, uh, fault is the input 1.1. Because in the input 1.1, there's supposed to be a path to ground opened by transistors M1 and M2. M1 is not suffering from uh, a fault and therefore it's going to be it's going to turn on properly. But M2 is suffering from a stuck open fault and therefore it's going to refuse to turn on. And therefore, even though we're supposed to see a situation uh, like this, with a path open to ground and the output being produced as zero volt, Instead, we're going to observe a situation where transistor M1 manages to turn on, but transistor M2 does not manage to turn on. Transistors M3 and M4 are all also cut off because the inputs to these two transistors are logic 1s. The inputs are VDDs. These two transistors are supposed to be cut off anyway, so this is a correct uh, situation for them. They are supposed to be cut off. If you look at the output in this case, the output is left hanging. It's a uh, high impedance node. It's a floating node. There's no path to either supply or ground. The path to supply and ground is cut off uh, on the pull-up network. It's cut off because it's supposed to be cut off, but in the pull-down network, it's cut off because of the fault. Now, this is not a valid situation for a CMOS gate because a CMOS gate has to have a path to either a low impedance path to either supply or ground for all inputs in the truth table, which indicates that we are dealing with a fault. So this is an error. And we indicate this error by writing the letter Z, which indicates that the output node is in a high impedance state. But what does that mean? What does that specifically mean? Uh, how do we observe this? What do we measure at the output of the gate to know that it is in high impedance? So the correct output of the gate is supposed to be zero volt. This high impedance node could possibly be at zero volt. You could actually see a zero volt output from this high impedance node. So it all depends on really on the history of how this gate was used. Because this high impedance node has a capacitance. And this capacitance is going to keep the last value that it observed. So you cannot actually uncover this fault by applying a single uh, input. You have to apply at least two inputs in sequence in order to uncover this fault. Specifically, we have to apply the input um, either 1, 0, 0, 1 or, or 0, 0. We have to apply any of the other three inputs to ensure that the output reaches VDD. So in that case, the output will go up to VDD. And then we apply the input 1,1. One, one. If the output of the circuit remains at VDD, then we know that this output is now in high impedance state and that this fault has occurred. If we see the output going to zero, then the circuit is working fine. So discovering that a node, an output node is in high impedance requires the application of at least two inputs in sequence. One input to force the output node into a state and then we apply the input for which we suspect that there's a fault and we see if the output is still stuck to the uh, first output or not. Now let's go back to the uh, fault M1 stuck short. So the stuck short fault just means that the transistor is always on. So the transistor refuses to cut off. Now 
Let's consider what happens for the inputs 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So transistor M1 is going to turn on when the input A is equal to 1. And therefore, we know for a fact that the inputs uh, 1, 1, and 1, 0 are not going to expose this fault. Because these inputs are inputs for which transistor M1 is supposed to be on anyway. And because the transistor M1 is supposed to be on and it is stuck short, 3 doesn't matter to the output and the output is going to present correctly. And so you will see that these two rows actually man match, the, um, match the output of, of the correct circuit. The input 0, 0 is also going to be correct. It's not going to produce an error. And that's because even though transistor M1 is supposed to be cut off, but refuses to cut off, transistor M2 is going to cut off in this case. And it's going to cut the way to ground, and it's going to prevent transistor M1 from producing an error at the output. On the other hand, the input 0, 1 is obviously the input that will produce the error that will allow us to uncover this fault. Why specifically the input 0, 1? Because for the input 0, 1, transistor M2 is on. And transistor M1 is supposed to be cut off. But because it is stuck short, it's going to also be on. So this creates a path to ground, even though that path to ground should not exist. And we cannot rely on M2 to cut this path to ground, because for that input combination, M2 is supposed to be on. The same situation also applies to the fault M2 stuck short. So for M2 stuck short, the only input that exposes us to the fault is the input 1, 0. Because for the input 1, 0, the transistor M2 is supposed to be off, but it refuses to be off because of the fault. So for the input 1, 0 specifically, Transistor M3 is cut off because its input is 1. Transistor M4 is on because its input is 0. Transistor M1 is on because its input is 1. Transistor M2 is on because it is stuck short. So this is the problem. This is the fault. And so how do we observe an output that indicates that this fault has occurred? So what we see here is a situation where we have a short circuit from the supply to ground in a CMOS circuit. This should never occur in the steady state for any static CMOS circuit, because in a static CMOS circuit, we, can only, we should only observe either a path to ground or a path to supply. And so this obviously indicates that we have a fault. But again, how do we measure this fault? How do we, what kind of thing do we look at to measure this fault? As this, at the entry in the table, ISC indicates, one way to do this is to, to measure the current that's being drawn from, from the supply. If you do manage to read a steady state current, a DC current being drawn from supply, then that means that this is a fault. This is a, an error that indicates a fault. So if you do measure a short circuit current for the input 1, 0, that indicates that the fault M2 stuck short has occurred. Because in the steady state, you should only measure uh, basically a leakage current in a CMOS gate. Another way to look at it is that we now have a voltage divider between the uh, pull-up network and the pull-down network. Uh, the pull-up network is working as it's supposed to be, but the pull-down network is providing a path to ground that it shouldn't have. So now we have a voltage divider between these two impedances, and so the output voltage is going to be neither VDD nor ground. It's going to be something in the middle based on the impedances of these two, two, two networks.